Hi, everybody. It's week three, um, and this week tags on to last week where, you know, last week I said, what is policy? And it seems like a simple question. It's not. This week, um, the question is, what is policy analysis? And you note, I gave you some readings to look at to, in our attempt to answer this question, and I will go through these as we move along. So my purpose really today um, is really twofold. One is to discuss different views of policy analysis as presented in our two texts. And the second really is to discuss our term project and how that fits into um, the, the realm of policy analysis. Okay, so um, I gave you this book by Raiden called um, Beyond Machiavelli. And I like her book, um, well, I like the title for one thing. If you've read Machiavelli, The Prince, um, this kind of uh, Italian Renaissance story of this advisor to, to royals, really. And we think of Machiavelli as sort of this cynical person who is basically interested in power by any means and, and holding on to power. But the the other aspect of Machiavelli is Machiavelli is an advisor, in a sense, a policy advisor to uh, those in authority. Um, and in a sense, that's really what policy analysis is about, uh, in a pure sense, is that policy advisors, really uh, po policy analysts, I should say, provide advice to policy makers, that being constitutionally authorized people who can make policy. And when I say that, I'm careful to say that because, you know, we think of lawmakers, really people elected to Congress or the state legislature or the city council or the school board. Those are the people who are constitutionally uh, designated as policy makers. But we also know, don't we, that there are other policy makers in our democratic system and in the systems of many nations. Um, and sometimes that comes under criticism, doesn't it? Uh, we, we think of people who work for agencies as designing policy. We know that our policy at the national level is based on law that Congress passes. And it's also based on what we call rules, which are, which are created by agencies. So think again of the example I used last week, the clean power plan, which really is a, is a rule or a set of rules from the EPA during the Obama administration. And now the Trump administration is going about trying to uh, turn turn away or turn over the, the clean power plan, right? But the clean power plan was never a law. It was a rule. Um, and so sometimes we do get I think justifiably confused um, because the the line between rule and law is sometimes rather blurry, isn't it? Um, so what Raiden's talking about really, and, and this is why I like her book, is is she's talking about how policy analysis really came to be in the United States. And it's really a, a, an outgrowth of World War II, as so many things in our modern American history are. Uh, World War II is this enormous historical watershed for so many things, but policy analysis really comes from that. And uh, this reference to uh, Harold Laswell in 1951, what Laswell is talking about, uh, Laswell himself innovated uh, the use of content analysis really as a methodology. Um, and he innovated, he and his, his uh, cohorts innovated it during World War II really to analyze Nazi propaganda, to understand uh, how uh, Goebbels and other propagandists in the Nazi regime were actually effective. And But what we also know from World War II is that was really uh, the first, we could call it the first sort of uh, scientific war. It was the first war where where the sciences and the social sciences were really brought to bear in the war effort. So economics theory was used in conjunction with strategic bombing. So the whole theory of strategic bombing w was really uh, something that was apart from military doctrine. It wasn't just to bomb uh, 
the enemy. It was to bomb actually the enemy's uh, centers of economic gravity, if you will. So bombing plants that produced various uh, various parts that were used in the war machine. So one of the more famous and costly um, bombing efforts by the Americans was bombing uh, the ball bearing factories in Germany. Because, of course, you can't operate any kind of machinery, mechanical device, without ball bearings. Um, and so that's an example of it. And after World War II, as a matter of fact, the, the Army Air Forces produced this, this really, really uh, voluminous survey, the Strategic Bombing Survey, to argue that they had been successful um, in shortening the war. But we also saw the use of operations research in military planning. So, for example, the Normandy invasion of 1944 was really, really, really heavily uh, colored with operations research and logistics research in order really to make that invasion a success. We saw the use of psychology in the training of military forces. We saw even things like uh, the science of diet. Uh, we know that uh, that the school lunch program actually was an outgrowth of World War II uh, because of the observation made by uh, military leaders that those men who had been drafted into the military uh, were exceptionally undernourished, many of them. Well, you know, we have to actually couple that with the fact that the United States was coming out of a very deep depression, economic depression. And so um, malnutrition might be understandable. And uh, also along with the depression, of course, we had uh, things like the Dust Bowl in the Plains states, and we had some uh, agricultural issues during the 1930s. But be that as it may, um, what we see is a lot of social science and hard science being put to use during World War II, um, not just the military, in an effort to win this war. And so policy policy analysis had its outgrowth from that. And again, in the 1960s, what we see um, is this growth of what was called planning, programming, and budgeting system, PPBS. This was actually a contribution by the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who was famously the, the, the CEO of Ford Motor Company, but he is also famously um, really a cost benefit analysis and a, a, a quantified, uh, a quanti what am I trying to say? He's a quantitative expert. Um, and this was his contribution. Um, he thought that, he said that the, the military budget should be based on matching uh, plans and programs together in order to create a budget that actually um, supported the plans and the programs. Well, that doesn't seem really revolutionary to us now, um, but that really wasn't the way things had been done. And this PPBS kind of thinking really disseminated itself throughout the federal government. Um, that mentality diffused throughout other agencies in the federal bureaucracy. And that has evolved, right? So now we have seen the growth of program budgeting, um, not just at the federal level, but at state and local levels, where we consciously try to tie the program and the policies of governments to the budget itself. And so this is very much uh, in line with what, what uh, Raiden is saying, that really this growth of policy analysis really was a post-war phenomenon. Um, but at the time, as Raiden points out, um, it was policy analysis was very much seen as a removed and neutral activity, as opposed to a political activity. Um, even though, um, you know, the policy analysts at the federal level were supporting the particular agencies and departments of particular presidents, for example, it was still seen as this kind of neutral activity. And the, the equivalent I would draw now um, would be to the Congressional Budget Office, which has existed since 1974. And the Congressional Budget Office was created specifically to be nonpartisan. 
and it still is that way. So um, the the Congress actually takes great pains to ensure that the CBO remains nonpartisan. And so all the policy analysis that you see coming out of CBO is nonpartisan, um, theoretically. Um, and, it, and it really is. Um, but we also now know that um, we have, I'll talk about this in a minute, we have nonpartisan think tanks, for example, RAND, but we also have partisan think tanks like Heritage Center or the Center for American Progress. But all of these had their beginning really during this era. So what is policy analysis according to our text, Kraft and Furlong? This is what they say on page 115, that really it, it consists of examining components of policy making processes such as formulation and implementation. So we go back to, if we go back to the simplistic notion that policy is created kind of in this stages model, um, policy analysis can be applied at many parts, many different stages of the model. It usually involves studying substantive policy issues like ensuring health care to the population. Um, it usually involves collecting and interpreting information to clarify causes and effects, right? And so this is where we can actually, uh, for example, uh, do regression analysis or other kinds of analyses where we can actually uh, identify the the effects and their statistical effects on dependent variables. Um, it does draw from numerous disciplines like economics, political science, psychology, philosophy. Um, I mean, I think I would probably add things like physical sciences, like climatology, biology, geology, uh, disciplines from civil engineering. Um, I'm not sure how you could do um, a policy analysis of for example, the road infrastructure without disciplines like civil engineering and hydrology and geology. Um, what about our policies regarding climate change? Obviously, uh, climatologists are not policy scientists, but, but their work has certainly influenced um, the policy of climate change. And, and I finally, um, as Kraft and Furlong mentioned, but I also like to mention is that I think policy analysis is really part science and part political judgment. Um, I Both are important and even if one believes that mm, science should be more important than political judgment, uh, the reality is political judgment is always is always there. So I'm going to spend a few slides just emphasizing the steps in the policy analysis process. Of course you're reading this this week. So I don't want to be too redundant, but I really want to emphasize this because this is where we're headed in our project as I'm going to talk about in a few slides. So Kraft and Furlong say there's five steps. I'm going to contrast what Kraft and Furlong say to what Bardak says uh, with, the, eight, with the, the eightfold path, if you will. So the five steps are define and analyze the problem, construct policy alternatives, develop evaluative criteria, assess alternatives and draw conclusions. So. The very most important thing in this is problem definition. If you don't know what the real problem is, then it's going to be hard to analyze that problem, right? So we have to recognize the situation as a problem of some type. So there's some unsatisfactory condition that requires relief from somebody, and that somebody could be private means or the government. Um, there has to be a recognition that you can actually describe this unsatisfactory condition in language that people understand. And you recognize that you must start coming up with causes. And so this is a lot more difficult, right? Because it changes the way that you present the policy alternative. So in a few weeks, I'm going to have you read about uh, the, the CBO report on Social Security. It's, it's a really thorough report. But Social Security, and I use this example because I use it a lot because it's so multifaceted. So people say there's a problem with Social Security. Okay, what is the problem with Social Security? Well, when you actually start talking about it, there are many problems with Social Security that you could state as a problem. You could state that the trust fund from which recipients are paid is actually going to uh, be bankrupt in about 2030. That's a problem, right? But you could completely separate yourself from that problem and you could state other problems about Social Security. For example, you could say that Social Security 
overpays people with means and underpays people without means. Well, why is that a problem? People, Social Security is based on your 35 highest years of income. Um, if if you, the jobs you had for 35 years weren't exceptionally well paying, that really means that your Social Security check when you turn um, full retirement age, 65 or 67 or whatever it might be for you, um, is still going to be small compared to a person whose 35 highest years of work were quite high. Uh, you know, a person can max out on Social Security, but what research has found is that is that the people that get the highest checks are probably also the people that need them least. So this is why people, some people advocate means testing for Social Security. So there are other problems that we could actually identify in Social Security, but you're still writing about Social Security. So you have to be careful to understand the, the problem that you want to define because it's going to drive the, the way your analysis is written. So the second step is construct policy alternatives. Um, so you have to recognize that there's different tools um, to to address the stated problem, right? Um, there are tools like regulation, subsidies, market incentives, taxation, direct spending, public education. Okay, this kind of brings us to a discussion of um, climate change for example. So we can regulate uh, the industries that produce uh, carbon emissions, the industries that affect climate change. We can regulate them, tell them you will not do that. Or, or we can use other tools like uh, carbon trading. Uh, we can use public education to educate people on climate change. Um, so not all policy alternatives actually involve direct government, right? Um, some do, many do, but not all of them actually involve direct government, do they? Um, so I would say smoking policy, for example, has involved both direct government, it has involved regulations, it's involved some market incentives, it's involved education, right? So we, we have for many years various levels of government gone to great lengths to educate people on the hazards of smoking cigarettes. Um, that has had some effect, but we also know that governments have used taxation as a direct tool to try to limit people from smoking, right? So it costs a lot more now to buy a pack of cigarettes than it did um, when my dad was smoking the little filterless camels that the army gave him as a draftee. Um, he, he paid very little for that pack of cigarettes. Uh, now he would pay, you know, maybe five or 10 times as much. So we've used both of those kinds of alternatives. So that's important. The third is choose the evaluative criteria. So, all right, so a lot of us really want to use quantitative models and that's great, that's perfect. We, we should actually be able, be able to identify dependent and independent variables and construct some kind of model that actually helps us isolate variables, right? But there's other means of doing policy analysis. Cost benefit analysis is one. Um, that is an exercise really in finding ways to monetize benefits and costs, which actually sometimes can become um, more subjective. There's risk analysis. Uh, the insurance industry is built on risk analysis. Um, there are political factors, right? And so we hear this a lot. People argue about constitutional rights. People argue about personal freedoms. People argue about public safety. In a sense, those are very abstract, but in another sense, they're very real. I mean, the constitution is a real document and it lays out uh, real rights. And so analyzing things in terms of constitutional rights is something that is feasible for you to do in a, in a policy analysis or things like damage to the environment. So you have to have an evaluative criteria. The fourth step is um, assess the alternatives. Now, he, okay, so here's where all of us get in trouble when we're doing a policy analysis. We have to 
fairly assess the alternatives. If I have three alternatives, I need to use the same criteria to evaluate all of them. I don't need to load in favor of my, my favorite alternative, and I don't need to use um, one kind of criterion for one alternative and a different kind uh, for another criterion. Um, the evaluation process actually involves applying the alternative to all of them, or applying the, the evaluative criteria to all of them fairly. And then finally draw conclusions. Okay, so um, what's your best approach and what's the recommended solution, right? So you can kind of see if you've learned about things like the comprehensive rational uh, decision-making model, that's what draw conclusions is. Um, is it always comprehensive? Is it always rational? Those are those are really the questions you have to ask yourself um, when you're when you're drawing your conclusion. And can you actually state the weaknesses of your own approach? That is, are you prepared to withstand the criticism that is going to be applied to your approach? Because criticism is really a fact of life. So there's different types of policy analysis that Kraft and Furlong talk about: scientific, professional, and political. So what's that about, right? Um, um, I'm actually referring to this in the week's discussion question. I say, have we balkanized policy analysis? You all know what balkanized means. You, you split you split everybody and everything up into their little tribes, just like was done in the, Bal the, the Balkans. But um, so have we balkanized policy analysis? We certainly, I would argue, and many people argue, we certainly balkanize media, right? Um, People who watch Fox News don't watch MSNBC and vice versa. Uh, you could argue that we've balkanized media, probably to our detriment, really. Um, but have we balkanized policy analysis? I, I gave you a list, I'll go back to this, of, uh, of I, scores of think tanks that uh, in the United States. Um, if you want to... If you want to talk about a policy area, you can get a policy analysis from Cato, from the Heritage Foundation, from the Center for American Progress, from RAND, from Brookings. You can get a policy analysis from a lot of different sources. You can maybe get one from the CBO or the GAO. Um, so have we applied too much political partisanship to our policy analysis? And does that actually hinder our ability to do scientific policy analysis and professional policy analysis? So does does the political policy analysis, which which by the way is not a factual, it probably is factual. Um, it's it certainly emphasizes the political analysis emphasizes different kinds of um, factors and conclusions. But but do those kinds of analyses hinder the pursuit of scientific analysis and professional analysis? Um, you know, a, a great example, it's not really policy analysis, but a great example of professional analysis being being ruined, really, is the story of Enron. Um, and we know that Enron really was uh, dishonest in their books, but they were aided and abetted by one of the most uh, famous and notable CPA firms, Arthur Anderson, which which went out of business because of Enron uh, and ru was ruined professionally. But that that's kind of a perhaps a tangential uh, example, but but an example nevertheless of how you can uh, ruin uh, so-called unbiased research with by in smuggling in your own bias. Um, and then there's this issue of evidence-based policymaking. I have you read um, some stuff from Professor Paul Kearney's website. I really like Professor Kearney's website, I have to admit. I think he's really accessible. I think he's down to earth. Um, and, and if you explore his website, you'll see a lot about policy. I, I really like his 1,000 word essays. He explains different approaches um, to the policy process in 1,000 words or less. And I think it, I think it's super, really. So I really highly recommend using his website. But but he's written a book on this idea of evidence-based policy making, um, and he's not critical of evidence-based policy making. What he's what 
he is doing really though is he's cautioning scientists really to uh, understand that the policy process policy makers themselves are not always going to necessarily listen to your scientific evidence should they yes uh, you know a, a member of Congress or a senator bringing a snowball into a hearing in Congress to prove that that climate change doesn't exist is ludicrous I think uh, you know I can go outside right now I'm looking at snow I can go out and make a lot of snowballs that doesn't mean climate change doesn't exist but um, the point is that policymakers are going to listen to evidence um, by using shortcuts rational what, what Kearney talks about is rational shortcuts um, and irrational shortcuts where they draw on emotions gut feelings deeply held beliefs and habits and I would also recommend there's this book by Baumgartner and Jones called the politics of information and Baumgartner and Jones talk about the the heuristics or the rules that policymakers use to help them make decisions um, and, and so the reality is and this is what Paul Kearney is getting at the reality is that that uh, yes there is evidence but there are also other factors to consider he's not painting a picture of a hopeless case what he's saying is that you have to be cognizant that uh, policymakers use maybe different rules than you use so I want to contrast that with what uh, Bardak talks about you know, with this eightfold path okay so I really like the eightfold path because it it really is a way of thinking so the project is not really the term project is not really organized around the eightfold path per se but I think if you use the eightfold path it's really going to help you think through your policy analysis so first again um, they talk about defining the problem so I don't want to be completely redundant they have uh, different steps um, but again define the problem right so we have to understand that uncertainty exists right um, and we have to be able to somehow quantify the problem it doesn't mean that you have to use exotic statistics it might just be simple descriptive statistics or comparisons but you have to you should be able to do that somehow second they say assemble evidence start assembling evidence here again here's what I kind of like about the Bardak um, book uh, and the approach that it's written from they use the approach that you're a, that you're a policy analyst and and you don't have all the time in the world to assemble evidence so there's various sources of evidence out there that you can use and you should understand what those are right there are government websites you know the census the uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics the Bureau of Economic Analysis there's good sources of evidence out there which help you uh, which help you because you don't have to recreate all the data right there's literature available and it's not always academic literature but popular media and think tanks the third step is construct alternatives so what Bardak talks about is starting comprehensive starting big and then going narrow right um, the biggest trap we fall into doing policy analysis is thinking you know we're going to solve everything so again I don't mean to be redundant but harken back to uh, Social Security um, no single policy analysis is going to fix Social Security you're better off thinking about Social Security and then looking at policy alternatives for something that you want to narrowly work on which might be for example um, the payroll tax is the payroll tax adequate just attack that problem um, so construct your alternatives and what Vardak and uh, Bardak says you should do is kind of again this is where you use a little bit of brainstorming right um, and ask yourself these questions and then then think think about it then that helps you narrow down so the fourth step is select the criteria of evaluation and here again this is really important I think to, to make the point here um, look at the book and see what they're talking about here what Bardak's talking about um, 
look at all those those one two three seven different um, kinds of criteria of evaluation. They are not all what we would call rational, right? Is political acceptability rational? Are freedom and community rational? And I would argue that most people would say they're not, but that doesn't make them invalid. Um, you have to decide based on the problem that you're attacking, what kind of criteria you want to use to evaluate, right? And then you want to have some kind of understandable metrics that support that. So you, you want to be able to have a way to measure freedom and community. You want to be able to have a way to measure policy sustainability. You want to be able to have a way to measure administrative feasibility. Um, so there's two parts, right? There's the criterion and there's the tool that measures it. And then you want to project the outcomes. So that's really just thinking about, hey, what happens if we if we keep doing this? That's really one of the, the basic things that the uh, Congressional Budget Office does. If you read about what they do is they project uh, laws and bills out to 10 years. They analyze the 10 year budget impact um, provided that no other laws will change. That's their basis of looking at new law um, or changed law. Um, so you want to project out. You have a base case such as the current rate of taxation and then you project it out. How's it going to affect um, the deficit? And so we know that a lot has been written uh, about the the Tax Reform Act of late 2017. Um, what's the impact on the deficit? Much of that comes from the Congressional Budget Office. Okay, so here's the, the last ones. Confront the trade-offs, stop, focus, narrow, deep, and decide and tell your story. So confront the trade-offs, right? So each of your alternatives might be a good alternative. That's the biggest thing. Um, sometimes I think when we talk about decision-making models, we have this idea that I have three alternatives or four alternatives, and one is clearly better. You know from working in organizations uh, that that doesn't happen. You know that sometimes there might be two or three alternatives that are really probably good to choose. So how do you choose them? I mean, what are you gaining and losing by choosing one and not choosing the other? This is where you kind of think in terms of opportunity cost. What am I giving up? to choose this alternative. And when I can state that, then I can say I would still choose this alternative in spite of knowing what I'm giving up here. Um, and then he says, what you really ought to do is kind of take a deep breath um, and say, okay, if this is really the best idea on earth, how come nobody's ever tried this before? That's a valid question. Um, and it's one that, that merits an answer. And then finally, tell your story. Um, so really, this is what your policy analysis is, uh, telling your story about this policy. And would regular people understand what you're saying? You know, maybe they wouldn't understand the tools you use, but they ought to understand your logic. And that's really important. So let me kind of move this into the course project and how we want to put it together. I think I have just a couple slides left here. Um, so your mission on this uh, policy analysis project is really to combine the thinking from these two texts, from Kraft and from Bardak, into two deliverables that I'm asking you to, to provide for this project. The first is your policy brief. Um, so this, not including reference pages and any kind of appendices or title page, this is going to be about 10 to 15 pages in length. And again, the reason I do that is because this is a simulation. You are simulating being uh, a policy analyst for a lawmaker or a person in the executive branch of government. Actually, some of you have done that. So you know that those people are busy. They, they would really love to read your 60 page paper, but they don't have time. So the policy brief is going to provide them what they need to know. Um, so I do want reference and cited in the text, actually. So all I'm asking for, if you see that Smith 2016 there, is in-text citations. Um, I'm really not hung up on using the APA um, bibliography. Um, 
I just really want a readable text with in-text citations. Um, the second deliverable really is what I call this roadshow presentation. So again, the person you're working for has to defend this policy change or this uh, new policy. And so how would they do that? Well, typically how they do that is they have their talking points, right? So we're all familiar with talking points, but they might also have a PowerPoint or other kind of media presentation um, that they can present at a moment's notice. So this is a 12 to 20 minute in length presentation, um, which explains the analysis to curious audiences. So that's really the, the approach that I'm using for this project. It is a simulation. And so here in this slide, I talk about the chapters. You see there's there's eight chapters, um, or it doesn't mean that it follows Bardock's eightfold path. They're just, it happens to be the same number. So first thing I want you to do is write me an exploratory memo, and that's due January 26th, coming up, um, in which you discuss your ideas with me. So that's part one of the project. So there's an assignment hanging out there on Canvas um, that explains this part of the project. This, the second part of your project is the executive summary. This is going to be a real brief executive summary. And even though it comes first in this list, this is actually something you would write last. So the third thing is the background and policy problem statement. So this is going to be part two of the project. Um, there is an assignment out there where you will give me the background and policy problem statement. My goal is to comment on that and, and get it back to you. And then you will use that to do part three, which is construct your policy alternatives and selection criteria. And then I will comment on that and get it back to you. And then part four combines the projected outcomes comparison, the recommended policy solution, and all your references and appendices. In other words, the completed project. So you can see this is in four parts. So you're gonna give me your exploratory memo, and then you're going to have another assignment that is your policy problem statement, a third assignment that has your policy alternatives with your selection criteria, and the fourth assignment wraps everything up. So really, we're building this policy brief as we go along. You can see how that works. And then part five is the presentation which you are going to create, and that is going to be presented, I would say, in class. This is an online class. It's going to be pre presented uh, on the discussion board during one of the, the second to last week of the class. And so during that week, your opportunity will be to view your classmates' uh, policy analysis projects and comment on them. So that's that's really the, the major effort for this class this term. So there's a couple references. Um, I'm looking forward to your discussion on the policy analysis process um, this week. Thank you.